rain dripping off the brim of my hat. It sure is cold today. Here I am walking down 66. Wish she hadn't done me this way. Sleeping under a table in a roadside park. Man, wake up dead. But it sure seemed warmer than it did. Sleeping in our king size bed. Has anybody come to San Tom or Phoenix, Arizona? Any place is better as long as I forget. The great Charlie Pride was many times ridiculed by people like uh, the Robert Altmans of the world in Nashville and parodied, called him Uncle Tom. But the truth of the matter is, is that Charlie Pride's one of the greatest country and western singers of all time, black or white or whatever. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, I wanted to talk a little bit today about not only that, but briefly just sort of touch on two gentlemen uh, this time around as opposed to my usual rambling bear, try to stay focused as I can, as they say, uh, and talk about, uh, on the one hand, Charlie Pride, on the other hand, Mr. Chet Atkins. I've touched on him before. I have a lot to say about Chet, but Chet, <clears throat> as well as being an amazing, uh, amazingly talented arranger and gifted guitarist, um, uh, fingerstyle guitarist, he was also a music producer and, um, and at the time, head of RCA Records Nashville and responsible for signing uh, what many people consider the death of country music in terms of the country politics, acts, such as Eddie Arnold and so on, or, uh, Patsy Cline, some of the more um, accessible pop country type stuff of the day. He's also the man who signed Charlie Pride to a record deal in the 60s. Um, <clears throat> and the way that Chet went about this was um, he had gone to Monterey, California to meet with the big wigs at RCA. And he just basically took a tape of Charlie Pride and no picture. Because he knew that if he brought in a black man singing country music to these people in the mid-60s. There was no way that he was going to get them to sign him. But he pulled a fast one because all they heard was the man's voice. They didn't have any sort of familiarity bias or anything else to judge him on visually. All they could hear was his voice and the sound quality of his voice blew them away. Later on, Jeff will be home and by the way, he's also black. You know. Um, and so, <clears throat> and then Charlie Pride, of course, had balls, man. You know what I mean? Like, in that particularly uh, polarized world, people think that we live in a polarized society nowadays, as if the 1960s didn't happen, or the Civil Rights Movement didn't happen. You know, it's like, you know, it, it, not that everyone's struggles aren't relative and real. Uh, I don't mean to undervalue uh, uh, anything that anybody goes through because it is a fucked up place we live in. Uh, but um, having said that, um, there was real threats of violence towards uh, his person. Uh, Charlie Pride uh, walked with it, his pride. And, uh, and, and you know, in a um, world like that, put it this way, there's a filmmaker out of Houston, Texas, named Raymond Gale made a film uh, a while back called Electric Purgatory that uh, deals specifically with um, African Americans playing rock and roll, rock music, which is ostensibly a music in which they create, uh, but yet they are alienated in modern terms. African Americans are alienated by playing the genre because they're not uh, accepted by their own community. It's not cool to be, you know, in the black community to be playing rock or whatever. And on the other hand, they're playing for a predominantly white audience. You know, and this sort of um, uh, not only the, the the ironies that are there, but also the real struggles. Um, for these folks to just be able to play music that's theirs just as much as anybody else's. Um, more so than anybody else's in many cases. And so, in any case, um, so <clears throat> between the two men, uh, they uh, crafted a new way uh, for many people 
to look at something that wasn't uh, what they were used to and was uh, in many ways groundbreaking in the sense that it forced people to reconsider their ideas about what is country music or what isn't country music. I mean, Chet was old enough, of course, to remember um, uh, you know, the original cast member of <laughs> the Grand Ole Opry was a black man playing a harmonica. I mean, you know, uh, it was a, uh, it is interesting um, how people, particularly within that genre of country uh, and Western, because country and Western is the most amalgamated uh, of all uh, the disparate sorts of cultural influences that come together to make it. It's not old, though. Uh, this notion that somehow bluegrass comes down from this ancient, you know, no, no, Bill Monroe, you know, uh, invented bluegrass in 1940. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, so, um, in any case, um, and as far as what he was doing, he was using these old fiddle tunes and so on that he was touching on that were, were not really all that old. I mean, um, relatively speaking, um, uh, from the British Isles and, and other places in the continent that came here, you know, uh, through vaudeville uh, or whatever um, in the early part of the 20th century. But America's a young place. And I think that one of the more interesting uh, things that happens, and I think this actually ties in to something else I want to talk about in a future uh, episode where I'm going to specifically look at, uh, go back to looking at Elton John's Tumbleweed Connection record again and giving him shit for that. Um, <laughs> but I think that uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the stuff comes from Jubal Early and these apologists for the Confederacy after the end of the Civil War, the Lost Cause writers that are often called, um, who somehow have you know they in trying to. Uh, aggrandize uh, the noble uh, southerner or whatever, they play up this, you know, antebellum period as if it were this, you know, longer and more, um, oh God, you know, it, it, they, they were conserver, conservers of this past and so on. Tradition, carrying it on, family tradition, you hear it in the country music all the time. It's about two, three generations old, you know. Uh, at that point, you know, as it's coming over here on boat, uh, and you know, coming from Europe, mostly uh, these folks, and uh, um, the notion you know, that uh, they're bringing something, you know, they're not reinventing the wheel when they get here. They're bringing their own sort of thing, and they get cross pollinated, and they become a new thing. But America's not that old. South's not that old, um, and these traditions aren't all that old. <laughs> um, so anyway, so. <clears throat> Charlie Pride and Chet Atkins uh, in in the 60s uh, were trying to do something and did something uh, that um, uh, is really inspiring today for me to think about. Um, I think it's worth talking about here in our, our look at the history of music before the cash got sucked out by the internet and all that stuff. Um, uh, but in any case, uh, if you take nothing away from this episode other than this, and that is Charlie Pride, one of the greatest singers regardless of his skin color in uh, American country and Western music, Chet Atkins, more than just being a great guitar player or uh, listener and producer of music, was a good man and a country gentleman, which is worth thinking about as well. Um, so, a tradition like any other, my ass master, you're only 100 years old, you know what I mean? Uh, whatever. But Chet was a country gentleman from the old school. <laughs>